We've got amazing statistics on the self-efficacy and the diversity yeah. of the people involved. Do you have a theory for this? Yes. Okay. Can you share <laughs> that with us? Um, yes. Uh, the theory is that, particularly around self-efficacy, is that hands-on, two things, three things. One, doing the hands-on hands -on work, even if it doesn't result in success, is absolutely critical for developing efficacy. Um, seeing similar others, so getting to see this national network of other people working in communities is absolutely critical. And then having a, a community of support that, that uh, can cheer you on. Because we know, I think the thing that um, frustrates me and excites me <laughs> um, about product development is we often only show the successes. We show success after success after success, right? We have movies. Um, I actually hate, I, I hate the, uh, what is it called, the social network? Facebook, what's the movie about Facebook? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I hate that movie. Um, here's why, it just shows this perfect success story and I had students running into my office afterwards and being like, well, I'm just gonna come up with a little idea in my office and it's gonna, it's gonna work. I think the real, the, my theory around self-efficacy is that you need to be immersed in a community, working day to day, both succeeding and failing, um, to gain confidence in your ability to tackle complex problems. Uh, I was just curious uh, if hi. you could oh, hi. How you uh, just comment on kind of the things that seem to work well, like online and on online platforms and the things that maybe still seem to need more like in-person collaboration or how you've seen that play out. Oh, the offline, online. So this has been interesting. We've, um, when we write about a lot of this work, people want to know, well, is this offline or is this online? <laughs> And we're, we're like, it's, it's hybrid, it's really a blend. Um, and we see this even happening, Behance, which is an online creative community run by Adobe, um, this week is offering these offline portfolio reviews, which I thought was particularly an interesting move of saying, listen, we understand that some of these relationships, many of these relationships need to de be developed offline um, to, and then can be continued online. Or vice versa, they can, you can meet online, but then many people are taking the time to meet offline, to connect face to face. So um, it's really a hybrid at this point. And um, people, take great, people report in taking great joy in finally meeting people that they've only met online um, for many years. And so I, I think to say that we could have one without the other is wrong. I think we need to start thinking about institutions um, as having both. And I, in some ways, I think higher ed's starting to think about this. These, without these campus-bound programs, um, how, do we think of, how do we think of the experience in a, in a hybrid sense rather than just one or the other? What, do you have a, I'm curious if you have a response to that. Or how, what, what were you thinking behind that question? Yeah, so we've been doing a lot of very detailed studies specifically around feedback, because interested in the, the role of grounding in feedback and how much grounding do you need to give and how much background and how much do you need to understand where that person's coming from and what kind of questions are good to ask online versus not online, um, where is the trade-off? So we're trying to come up with kind of a mapping system so we can more effectively guide people like, okay, so for that kind of question, if you want to reach authentic users and get this legitimate feedback, you probably want to take the time to travel, get there. If it's, if it's this other kind of question that doesn't require as much grounding, you could use this alternative community. So trying to figure out how to basically leverage the tools that we have. Yeah. We're back here. Okay. Thank you. Um, as a sign what's your What's your name? Uh, my name is Adrian Rodriguez. I'm a first year MBA at the high school. Awesome. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend you with my MBA comment. No, no, not at all. <laughs> um, so as Design for America goes to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any insights on how it transcend, you know, some of these principles transcend cultures oh. and, and then also how they transcend infrastructure differences. So, oh my gosh. you know, if you like, Getting uh, a 3D printer in the south side of Chicago is one thing, yep. but also getting it in Nairobi is another thing. So if you could comment on those two. Oh, that's such a fabulous question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. One of my colleagues, um, 
Pam Hines, who's down at at Stanford just wrote an interesting piece about the adoption of design thinking pro practices across um, the globe and how um, fail early, fail often is not like doesn't work in some cultures. Like you can't you can't do that. <laughs> um, uh, so that's that's more of a cultural. And then the infrastructure, I think, is a is another interesting question. So so what we're doing with each of these entities is I feel very strongly that we can't just replicate stamp and repeat, stamp and repeat. Um, it, that's not how it's going to work. Uh, what we're really trying to do is um, support people around the general idea that. Um, that people can be empowered to solve community problems in their community. So I'm hoping that's that's like a cross culture. I'm hoping that message will go cross cultural, and then try and figure out, look at examples in their community of how that's been done before, and help them connect with that that path. So the path that they have gone down before. I think to do a cookie cutter approach and just throw it over the fence is 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 not responsible. Um, but I think to support existing infrastructure and existing culture um, with, with new models is possible. There's this wonderful phrase, um, perhaps you've heard it, it's called um, desire lines. Have you heard of this? It comes from architecture in which, um, supposedly architects, any architects in the room? Oh, great. OK, tell me if this is true. Um, on college campuses, when there's big spans of grass and there'll be a little muddy path across, across the way, the idea is that you look and you say, oh, that's where, that's where people want to go. There's not currently a path there, but people want to go. And by virtue of going there, they've demonstrated it's physically possible to go there. Um, so I often think about when bringing something into a new community, look at what's possible, what's been done before, where do people want to go, and then add the infrastructure to support them and help them go that direction, rather than, I guess the contrast would be coming in with a bulldozer and just laying down the path that worked for you at the last place. Does that make sense? So I guess, I guess that's culturally, I'm, I will, yeah, I want to be culturally sensitive to how we do this and recognize infrastructure. Also recognize that infrastructure is changing rapidly, too, um, and what is here today might be, might be different tomorrow. Thank you. I really appreciate you asking that question. Yeah. Back here. Hi, my name is Pierce Gordon. I'm a fifth year PhD student in the Energy and Resources Group. Thank and I'm you. Alice's student, one of them. Awesome. Um, yeah, very yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, so a lot of people and a lot of things that you've talked about in the presentation actually lead up to my question. So I thank you for that. Um, ideas about feedback, ideas about impact. Yeah. Um, so my field is trying to uh, fit together the worlds of innovation and evaluation. Mm, that's a fun one. Uh, yeah, it is. Did you like my sign, some success of impact slide? Yeah, I did. Yeah. That, that's what got me thinking about it. Um, <laughs> so in this, I, I've noticed, particularly in the fields of international development, mm -hmm. um, the fields of innovation work and evaluation work don't fit well. Um, the way, at, as far as I They don't as fit I've, well with each other? Yes. They, okay. Um, at least the way that they are uh, approached in their um, dominant forms. Hmm. Um, design thinking on one side and uh, impact evaluation, RCTs, mm -hmm. big projects on the other. Um, and I've been doing a lot of searching to find entities um, in the self-efficacy, mm -hmm. capacity building sphere mm -hmm. of trying to give people resources to not just de design and innovate different things mm -hmm. that um, address problems in their context, but evaluate whether or not those things that they create actually are the things that they should care about. Mm -hmm. um, so in that context, I wanted to ask um, if you've come across thinking, uh, mm -hmm. people, communities, or if you've worked in understanding that issue um, in some of your own work. Yeah, so I, let me react on two levels. One is with our participants, we talk about that a lot because it's, again, I think it's um, disrespectful and irresponsible to just th throw things at people and not evaluate, not be honest with yourself and with them about what, what constitutes success. Like I just, that's, that's my position as a, as a designer. Um, so we have, a, we have a lot of curriculum around understanding what success looks like for your partner, what success looks like for your team, coming to agreement about what that might look like, and then having regular check-ins about whether you're hitting that, hitting that or not. So that's, with our, that's a self-guided curriculum to think a lot about that. Um, 
and also think much more broadly about impact from impact being millions of dollars raised, millions of lives touched to it could be one day 50 people. But, so, so anyway, just thinking very broadly about that. Um, in terms of my own work, I've been very concerned about this too because we put a lot of effort into things and I wanna be honest with myself and say, is this, is this worth it? Are we getting a return? Are we actually getting what we think? Um, specifically around the self-efficacy bit, I've developed a, uh, um, with Adam Carberry um, a tool around innovation self-efficacy and we do that every year with our own organization to understand where people are moving and if we're making any improvement in that in that realm. So I feel very good about that. Um, I do like, but, but self-efficacy alone would not be a sufficient um, measure for me because I feel like you could have a lot of people who are self-efficacious but don't do anything, um, which I think is, is like, I, it's not the world I wanna live in, but um, it's a lot of confident, confident people. Um, so I, I'm always looking for multiple measures myself, but like you, I really, I struggle. I struggle with that slide every time, I adjust it every time, and I kind of tweak it and think, how else can I tell the story of what we're doing and how can I be clear about what's working what's working and what's, what's not working um, so we can know whether, whether to continue or not.